Aloha, everyone. Hope you're having a glorious day. This is everyday theology because what you believe matters. We are going through this book week by week, and this is week six on salvation. Soteriology, a very important topic of the Christian life, of the Christian walk. So let's dive right in. Salvation is a miraculous gift of God. Salvation is totally a gift of God. Nothing you can do can earn this gift. We are a new creation. We lovingly obey God in response to lavish love he expressed to us through the gift of Jesus. Every world religion deals with the problem of overcoming evil, suffering, and death by you earning your own way. Do the 613 mitzvot, the commandments of the Tanakh, Midrash, and Talmud for Judaism. Do the ascetic practices of the Vedas for Hinduism. Do the five pillars of Islam. Do the eightfold path of Buddhism. Do the ancestor worship for Shinto. Do these things and you will earn the favor of God or the favor of the universe. Only Jesus saves you. He does all the work of salvation. He comes down from his high place of heaven, makes himself humbly low for your sake, dies in your place, and you earn favor with God for what he himself did. But what is your part? This is a relationship. You repent, believe, accept the relationship. Trust what he did was for you and follow him. True repentance is a hard turn away from all that doesn't please God. Admitting the wrong, taking responsibility for the action, and changing the behavior. Repentance is not a one-time action. When we repent, we stay close in our relationship to God. See, many approach this like, well, I mean, I just need to believe in Jesus, right? Then I'm good with God. Heaven? Oh, I'm in. Well, this isn't like I believe in unicorns or even that I believe historically it was true. I, I, I wish it was true. So if I wish hard enough, then it will come true. This is many people's uh, irrational belief. Think about this. Even demons believe Jesus is real. Demons acknowledge him as the Son of God. Jesus' own brother, Jacob, or James in the Bible. It says, you believe that God is one. Well and good. Even the demons believe that and tremble with fear. So believe is used many times in the context of one determined to follow Jesus. It does not mean blind faith or just this, well, I hope it's real. I hope it's true. Here in John, I have written these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may know that you have eternal life. The believe there in Greek is pisteu, pisteo. It means conviction and rational intellectual trust. So if you like, I have written these things to you who are convicted by and have a rational trust in the true historical events of the Bible account about the Son of God so that you may have complete confidence that you have eternal life. Charles Blondin, a Frenchman 
who would walk across the Niagara Falls on a cable in 1859. This cable was suspended above the falls, almost 200 feet. And he would even carry Harry Colcord across on his back. Well, when he got uh, to the side where all the people were, uh, he would pull these antics, these stunts. He would take a wheelbarrow across, and then he would come back, and he would load up a sack that weighed about 140 pounds and take the sack in the wheelbarrow across the Niagara Falls. When Charles came back, he would ask the crowd, who here believes that I can carry someone across the Niagara Falls in the wheelbarrow? All the crowd yelled. They believed he could do it. They believed. Then Charles would ask the crowd, who wants to get in the wheelbarrow? Silence across the crowd. See, that is trust. That is pisteo. It's a picture of trusting, completely relying on salvation completed by Jesus. Biblical faith rests on the historical life, death, and resurrection of Christ. And trusting God's reliability to get in the wheelbarrow, to be carried to the other side, now that is trust. Conviction only has two responses. Ignoring or a hardening of your heart or repenting, which is changing your mind, changing your ways to follow Jesus. Jesus' followers love others and follow God's commands because we're so grateful God loved us. We follow Jesus not out of obligation to gain God's favor. Nothing we could do could earn it unless we were perfect. We have something better, a living relationship whereby he is transforming our hearts, changing our minds, changing our actions, and claiming us as his sons and daughters. We are justified through Jesus alone. God is righteous. God is justice. God is mercy. God is grace. Not one of us is righteous. All have sinned. None is without excuse. There's an unbridgeable chasm that was bridged by something nobody could do. So there would be someone, Jesus, everyone could trust to walk across this bridge. See, it's an open invitation for everyone. Everyone could do this. You just have to trust. Justification is not that our debt is exchanged, our debt of sin is exchanged with an empty ledger wiped clean. Christ's obedience and righteousness is seen by God in place of our debt. This is not God sees me in Christ just as if I have never sinned. This is God sees me in Christ just as if I'd always obeyed. This is ridiculous justification, unbelievable grace. Adoption is God's design. We are adopted as a child of God. It means every right, responsibility, and reward is granted to you. God disciplines and provides for you as a parent and a good and loving father. We enjoy a family of brothers and sisters encouraging us, mourning with us, celebrating with us. This loving father and family does not prevent hard times and suffering. Before following Christ, we were slaves to sin, resulting in fear. Following Christ, we are adopted into a family with the, with the security, assurance, and hope he has overcome. We will inherit an eternity in the family of God. Sanctification 
is the process of knowing Christ and becoming more like Him. We are already and not yet. We are set apart for His purpose and use until the time of His return. First, we are set apart from sin when we repent and trust Jesus took our sins away. Next, we live an ongoing process of a Christ follower becoming more like Jesus that continues till death. Upon death or Jesus' return, whichever come first, we are perfected in glorification. With glorified, incorruptible bodies, we will rise again. This process is accomplished out of loving Jesus and wanting a deeper relationship, including disciplines like reading his word, prayer, fasting, meditating on and memorizing scripture, worship and service to others with the help of our family, the people of God, the church, who is a people. I have the distinct honor and privilege of serving as a deacon at our fellowship. In counseling some, I come across a grandma or a parent who says something along the lines of, well, you know, my granddaughter was baptized as a baby and I've heard once saved, always saved, so she's saved, right? Or, hey, I'm concerned about my son because he has been into partying and drugs, but he went through confirmation and he even prayed the sinner's prayer, so he's saved, right? Well, I find the adage, once saved, always saved, is used to bring comfort to family members who are worried about the salvation of their family. Are we once upon a time Christians? I did that. I've been there. I got the t-shirt. I have the insurance policy safely tucked away in a file, and I can pull it out if I really needed it. Before we trust a quip like once saved, always saved, we should carefully study the truth found in Scripture. First, read the passages among others, these, to get a sense of how secure salvation is for those who truly desire a relationship with God, who want to follow Jesus, even when they mess up big time and they want to repent and come back to their father, just like the prodigal son, he welcomes them with open arms. But a relationship requires the desire for commitment from both people in the relationship. Try as hard as you want. You cannot force your spouse to love you. I have counseled many broken relationships, and this is not for lack of trying. Many people want the other person to love them. They don't want the divorce. They don't want the person to not love them, but they can't force them. You cannot force a person to be your friend. You cannot make even your child genuinely love you. Once saved, always saved makes two huge mistakes. The first is the word once. It misrepresents the continuous process of salvation. Secondly, asking the question of is so-and-so saved is the wrong question. We are not suited for the great white throne seat of judgment. We should go to that grandson or daughter or friend. And when we learned they professed they were a Christian, but now we know they are not behaving as if they are following Jesus, we can ask them directly hey, are you following Jesus? This is our duty. We are our brother's keeper. Cain renounces this duty before God. Jesus is always saving. We are always following, always transforming, and always seeing fruit. See you next week.